Parks and I'm the co-director of CLF um, Concussion Legacy Foundation at McGill with Emily that has been on here before. Um, today I'd like to welcome Dr. Ellenberg. Um, Dr. Ellenberg focuses on um, child development and specifically looks at the brain. Um, the, object the objective of his lab is to understand the organization and functional plasticity of the human brain during its development, its recovery potential, as well as the limits of this plasticity. To examine these questions, we are studying the effects of different, uh, he's studying the effects of different pathologies on the perceptual and cognitive development of the child. His studies are based on experimental paradigms in psychophysics, electroencephalology, um, and the brain, and imaging, DTI, like DTI. These tools allow us to assess the functions of, allow him to assess the functions of the brain as well as the neuroelectric and neurochemical properties of the neural mechanisms that underlie these functions. Um, so would you mind just um, briefly summarizing some of the things that you're working on right now? Um, okay, well, to start with, I, I'm a neuroscientist uh, at the University of Montreal at uh, the School of Kinesiology and Exercise Sciences. So in French, we say École de Kinesiologie des Sciences de l'Activité Physique. Uh, I'm also a neuropsychologist, a clinical neuropsychologist, um, whose interests uh, as a clinician are learning disabilities, but also concussion, whether they are sports related or not. Um, my lab really is interested in, in several things. Um, that revolve around brain health. Um, and, and more specifically, I'm interested in the brain health during development, but I do also have uh, a few studies going on with adults, because sometimes in order to understand the developing brain, it's good to know how, how does it reach? What are the steps required for it to reach an adult level or mature level of uh, functioning? The main focus of my program is brain injury um, related to sports. Uh, however, I do have some uh, experiments, some studies that are interested in the effects of physical exercise on brain development, uh, and also some studies uh, using perhaps or looking at aspects of visual perception. But today, uh, we're gonna focus more on my work related to concussion. I, I actually have, um, with regards to concussion, I have uh, both a uh, scientific interest and a social interest. Um, I just, just for the record, I was involved in uh, several government policies uh, and work groups in Quebec uh, related to concussion. So, uh, from 2013 to 2019, and, and, and that for me is such an important part. Uh, I also uh, personally do a lot of work to uh, educate and to build awareness on concussion within the, um, my, my local community and also in Quebec uh, through the media, uh, in which I'm very present, whether it is radio or TV, and through books that I've published. I, I actually, I was the first to publish a French book on concussion. It was definitely not the first book on concussion because there were several others in English, really excellent, amazing pieces of work, uh, but there was nothing for uh, the French community, whether it was in Quebec or even in Europe. And now I'm actually publishing my third book on concussion in April, uh, again, for the Francophone community, because I think there's amazing stuff that's been done for the uh, English community, but nothing for uh, the French speaking population. So that's uh, sort of a picture of what I do uh, socially uh, and, and what I, I, I hope to do to build awareness and to educate, because I feel that the main purpose of my research and my lab is to ultimately transfer, uh, is to ultimately assure that there's some kind of translation of this information to the general public. And that's why I think studying concussion is so interesting for me. It really answers two fundamental needs that I have. One, my basic scientific need, which is to understand the human brain. And one way 
to understand the human brain is to study its development and to study it when it undergoes different challenges. And that allows us to see how it's wired and to understand its vulnerabilities. So I like, and I, and I think it's interesting to study concussion in that sense, because it's really uh, a perspective uh, into the brain and the brain's functioning. And the other aspect that it really tailors to is, is the one that I mentioned earlier, um, the results of my work, the results of the work of my colleagues around the world, uh, allow uh, us all to contribute to policies, to uh, education, to building awareness. Uh, and I think this is in, in fields like concussion or, or other health conditions, I think scientists do have an important role in that to make sure that there is a transfer and to make sure that we are involved in um, basically transforming these sometimes complex concepts into simple, uh, uh, into simple points that everybody can grasp and do something with. So now if, if, you, if you allow me to, and I think that's, that's the purpose uh, of the meeting here today or of the podcast is to delve into uh, more into my research. Um, so even within concussion, uh, my research is interested in different aspects. Um, there, I guess the two main aspects are understanding what happens to the brain immediately after the injury and for the following days uh, and weeks in order to find better ways to um, get athletes to return uh, to play, but in a secure way, if returning to play is the thing for them. But we also have to remember that sh that should not be, and I hope this changes, that should not be the ultimate goal. Because at some points, uh, we have to realize that for, for some individuals, returning to play uh, should not be the priority if uh, the individual's last concussion, whether it is the first concussion or its third, his third or her third or fifth concussion, has had an impact, a uh, significant impact on their brain functioning, which allows us to predict that perhaps another concussion might have devastating consequences. By devastating consequences, I, I don't necessarily mean something like a second impact syndrome where an athlete is left with um, severe handicaps. But for me, devastating consequences is an athlete who, um, well, because of the accumulation of concussion would have deficits in working memory and attention, in, in long-term memory that would make it really hard for them or perhaps impossible to complete their university degree or to go on to university if that is what they choose to do. So I think we need much better tools, much more sensitive tools uh, to take that into account. And that is what we are developing uh, in our lab. Uh, we have um, a recent study uh, that's been published that shows that if we use uh, the basic um, concussion computerized batteries, and there are many of them, and I, I think most people, you know, know several of them that are uh, on, you know, that, that can be uh, used by professionals, I, I think like physiotherapists or athletic therapists or psychologists uh, that are administered over a period of 15, 20 minutes. And, and you know, typically they're used uh, with baselines, and then there's some testing after a concussion, whether it is once or a few times. Well, we actually used one of those batteries and we've tweaked it a bit. We've made it more complex. Um, we added in one of the conditions more, um, a higher load on working memory uh, to ultimately also increase the load on sustained attention. And what we found is that when we have the basic version of the test, and then when we have the version that we've made more complex, 
we see that our athletes immediately after the injury were normal uh, compared to um, a normative baseline on the test uh, as it is sold, as it is commercialized. But when we make it, uh, when it's higher, when it has a higher load on working memory and attention, we find deficits. And this is to us, and this, this has been published recently, and this to us is significant because we need to find ways to make sure that we understand the consequences of concussion on brain function uh, in the youth, in uh, young adult athletes, because their primary goal uh, you know, is, is success in school. Of course, their passion or one of their main passions is sports. And we definitely want to support that. We wanna cultivate that. We wanna give them the tools, but not to the loss of these unique brain abilities, right? Um, that are the foundation for their future. So this is something we've been working on. And another thing we've been working on related to um, assessing concussion uh, immediately after the injury um, is again with these tests that we've developed uh, that uh, are uh, or that appear to be more sensitive to the different types of commercial uh, batteries that that are found. Uh, one of the tests that we've used um, and that's that have also been used before. Uh, we didn't create that, but it's a switch task. Um, a switch task, which is a heavier load on working memory, but on executive functions. Uh, so a lot based on Miyake's model of, of attention and executive functions that involves inhibition and working memory. Um, by using the switch task, we can actually tap in to uh, cognitive challenges immediately after the concussion that are not found with other tests. And also what we've noticed is that Perhaps um, something that is done when athletes are typically tested with commercialized batteries is they're often tested after a period of rest. You know, an athlete's been concussed, and then there is a period of, you know, 24, 48 hours rest minimum, maybe a few more days, and then progressive return to cognitive activity and physical activity. And then they come into the clinician's office, uh, they're typically well rested or rested enough and they do the testing battery. But that's not what happens on a game, right? I mean, sometimes students will spend a whole day in school, they're gonna be taxed cognitively and then they start playing and then they're fine for the first five, 10 minutes. But whether it is soccer, whether it is hockey, they're doing like high intervals, you know, right? their uh, intense physical exercise and then rest and intense physical exercise and then continuous physical exercise. Could that affect cognitive function differently in people who are recently concussed versus people who have never had a concussion? So we've also run our tests following uh, bouts of physical exercise and also following bouts of cognitive intense cognitive uh, activation. And here again, uh, we found and, and, and we've published um, that athletes who have a concussion, who, perf who perform normally under conditions of, of rest, right? That is without doing much prior to doing the test uh, versus those who had uh, an intense, um, physical or cognitive activation, um, definitely we, we find a significant difference. Uh, we find that athletes who uh, perform our tests after physical exercise or a cognitive, uh, uh, a high intensity cognitive, cognitive workout uh, by solving, uh, by doing these um, basically uh, complex logical problem solving for about 50 minutes, which is, similar to what someone can do in, in, in the classroom during like a block of, you know, math or, or, or language arts, for example, um, then we see that 
they make more mistakes. We see uh, on our cognitive tasks, we see that their working memory is not as uh, efficient. We see that their uh, sustained attention is not as efficient. And this is work that I've been doing with Dr. Uh, um, Veronique Sicard, who is now a postdoc in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and work that I've been doing with uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Robert Davis Moore, who is a, a scientist in, uh, in Carolina, um, in, in the States also, North Carolina. And he, um, and, and so this is, I feel so, so important because perhaps we're underestimating the consequences of concussion um, sort of in the acute phase by not having the tools that are sensitive and the conditions that mimic more uh, what happens in real life. And, and so our upcoming studies uh, are delving even further into that, into creating testing situations which are much more similar to what an athlete uh, experiences when he is on the field. So a combination of cognitive and physical demands um, and, and the impact that this has on rapid decision-making, on, on rapid decision-making either for, you know, making a, a cognitive or uh, decision or rapidly um, planning, because as many sports like soccer, like hockey, uh, like basketball, um, this they highly solicit executive functions, which require um, higher order planning, right? Um, and this is something that we have shown to, that we have found to be part, particularly vulnerable to concussion. So it's really important that tests um, that aim to determine the consequences of concussion do look into these higher executive functions. Um, and so, yeah, our future work will will look into combining. Uh, and this is actually well, I'm saying our future work. This is actually what we're doing right now. That's what we're collecting data on uh, right now. So that's one part of Can my I research. Ask you, uh, one question about what you said before. For sure. Um, so you were saying. So I understand the battery um, and tests like that are to assess the short term effects of concussion, um, so we can have a better understanding of how the brain is impaired short term. But I thought it was really interesting when you said that you're trying to develop things that can tell you whether a concussion, a, sub a subsequent concussion will result in long-term impairments. So mm -hmm. is can the battery be used for that too? Or um, what are you working on with respect to that? Yeah, that, that is really interesting. And here, we're really working on estimates. So we, we do need to develop, and that's what we're working on, these tests that are more sensitive and that uh, involve cognitive functions that are solicited in everyday life. You know, as we know, if we, if we aim to test sustained attention, uh, so that is focusing, uh, this needs to be tested. We know that the mechanisms to tap into sustained attention require us to do one task, that has particular characteristics, right? For a long period of time, that is for at least 15 minutes. And to my knowledge, unless I'm wrong, none of the commercial tasks do that. They will together uh, sum up different subtests that assess different aspects of cognition. And together they will, uh, might take 15, 20, 30 minutes but you're changing tasks and you're having tasks that tap different mechanisms. But if you hope to challenge sustained attention, which we see is vulnerable to concussion even after the injury, we need tasks that are specifically designed to do that. Uh, we need tasks that are specifically designed to tap into higher order working memory. So by developing these tasks, therefore that are more similar to what a student uh, in everyday life does, which is highly challenging cognitive um, feats, right? Much more challenging than, than what, we tip, what we have with typical batteries. Um, that will allow us to, uh, and that's what we're developing algorithms, like to do some kind of reverse engineering 
to estimate um, the consequences of another concussion for this person. By, so by looking at how the athlete uh, is compared to a normative baseline, because we do believe that norm normative baselines are efficient and there are at least two studies that tell us that um, for most individuals, we don't necessarily need a, um, a baseline reference that is specific to the athlete. Uh, you know, unless the athlete has a history of multiple concussion, of course, unless the athlete uh, ha has, you know, is intellectually gifted or is, uh, has uh, a learning disability. Most athletes uh, will, uh, and most individuals, um, a normative baseline is as efficient. And, you know, we have a few studies that have shown that. So we believe that by comparing um, on, on these tests that are more relevant to what you do in class, in school, by using normative baseline, by creating algorithms to predict, we'll be able to predict uh, by comparing deficits and deficits after one concussion and a second concussion, what a, a new concussion could have uh, as a consequence, what kind of consequence that could have on their everyday cognitive functioning. Because the last thing we want is we want to pull athletes out of their sport before they reach a point of no return. And, and I remember I was told it's many years ago, you know, maybe 12 years ago uh, by someone in the field who said, well, you know, in order for me to justify uh, to remove an athlete completely from their sport, I have to convince the coach that the athlete now has uh, functional deficits. So that means removing the athlete after they've passed the point of no return, after there's a functional lesion, you know, that supposedly or hypothetically is, is irreversible. And I feel that we need to find ways uh, to predict uh, when, you know, the following, the next concussion will be the one that will make them shift uh, beyond uh, this point of no return. Definitely waiting after or waiting for functional lesions is definitely too late. I wouldn't want that for myself. I wouldn't want that for my kids. I wouldn't want that for any, any students. So that's, that's one big component of my concussion research. The other component is looking at the long-term effects of concussion. And I feel that is something that has been highly neglected. Um, and in and, and this regards something called the post-concussion syndrome, uh, which is still today highly controversial. But I feel that the research, uh, if if one, and I know there are major contributions, but at least one important contribution of sports concussion research has been to show us scientifically, to demonstrate that there is biological underpinnings, uh, neurophysiological underpinnings to a uh, uh, post-concussion syndrome. Post-concussion syndrome is uh, people who following a concussion, uh, basically symptoms, physical symptoms, um, emotional symptoms, uh, cognitive symptoms do not go away, that they stay after a long period of time, two months. I mean, depending on studies, depending if you refer to the DSM-4, uh, uh, DS I'm not talking about the DSM-5 because they, it was it's, it's not as well uh, presented in there or whether you, uh, you refer to the ICD-10, um, you know, post-concussion syndrome uh, manifests itself either uh, in someone who has persistent symptoms where typically three or more, um, four to eight weeks or four weeks to three months, sorry, uh, after the injury. Symptoms that cannot be explained by other factors than uh, the relationship with the injury. And so now with imaging studies that show that the brain is actually the human brain, not, not just the rat brain or you know, the, the brain of the mouse, but um, we, we find that uh, in humans, whether it's using um, magnetic resonance imaging, 
DTI, so uh, diffusion uh, tensor imaging or MRS, that is uh, um, magnetic resonance with spectroscopy. Um, we can see, and, and other, other uh, imaging techniques, uh, uh, also, um, as you've mentioned earlier on, electroencephalography that we combine with cognitive testing. So they're called uh, cognitive evoked potentials. We find that neurophysiologically, there are alterations that persist over time. Several labs have shown that. Uh, we have also found that. Uh, and I think, and, and so one part of my research is really to delve into understanding the bio, uh, the biological, psychological, and social constituents of the post-concussion syndrome. And why? Why do some athletes, typically referred to as the miser miserable minority, um, and I don't think it's necessarily the right term because we it's estimated that 15 to 30 percent it's a wide range but um of athletes will have systems that persist beyond the acute phase so let's say beyond six to eight weeks um to me 30 percent is definitely not a minority that's a third or nearly a third of athletes um and so as i was saying initially uh one major contribution that the sports concussion research has done is to tell us that this is, there is actually um, a true post-concussion syndrome. And I'm saying that in contrast to the same uh, phenomenon in people who've had a concussion or mild traumatic brain injury that is not sports related, whether it's related to a car accident, a work accident, um, it's often believed and they're often deemed to have, uh, so those folks, who have persistent symptoms are often categorized as being more, or their symptoms, sorry, I'm having a hard time to express this, but their symptoms are often uh, categorized as being more psychogenic in origin or psychosomatic. Uh, often um, by claiming that a concussion has little to no consequence on the brain or a mild traumatic brain injury has little to no consequence on the brain because very few imaging studies have been done on uh, non-sports related MTBI. Most studies typically combined several TBIs non-related, you know, non-sports related. So you'll have mild, moderate, severe. And so it's hard to know what happens only in the mild range. Um, and, and, and so by isolating a group like athletes who've had an accident, a concussion that is con comparable to an MTBI, and, and a few studies have shown that, there's a really nice meta-analysis, it's older now, by Belanger and colleagues that compared the cognitive consequences immediately after the injury in MTBI, non-sports related, and MTBI or concussion that is sports related, and found that they were comparable. Uh, and, and so we have evidence now uh, from athletes that it does change the brain. It does leave uh, some change. And there's actually studies of post-concussion syndrome in athletes also. So this is what we are uh, currently uh, looking to. The cognitive profile, the cognitive signature of uh, post-concussion syndrome in athletes. And hopefully we want to do that in a more structured and organized way than has already been done in non-athletes by um, running the same um, um, sort of comprehensive uh, battery of cognitive testing. But here I'm talking about the type of batteries that neuropsychologists will use in clinic in order to make this more applicable. So not necessarily tests that are devised in the laboratory, or tests uh, you know, that are, are commercialized to be used only in the acute phase, but tests that have been shown to be quite sensitive to uh, mild alterations in brain functioning that are used by neuropsychologists in, in, in their offices, in their clinics, in hospitals, uh, in order to find better ways to document the post-concussion syndrome. Because most people, um, 
and this is really the main focus of my last book that 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 will actually that I've just published that will come out in uh, August fifteenth uh, in French, which is on post concussion syndrome uh, in athletes and in non athletes, um, and and a lot of people undergo a lot of stigma. Uh, who uh, folks who've had either a car accident, a work-related accident, and who have symptoms that persist for, for months, sometimes up to a year, a year and a half. And, um, you know, they're real symptoms. Of course, they're at that point, perhaps are psychological factors like depression and anxiety that uh, kick in additionally, that perhaps serve to maintain some of this, but it surely does not explain um, the post-concussion syndrome. One, studies from our lab, studies from other labs have shown that having a concussion uh, alters emotional regulation. Uh, so it alters brain function in the frontal lobe region that are involved in regulating uh, our emotions and that are involved in regulating how we react to stressful situations. So we become more sensitive to a situation of stress, uh, not because we're more emotional or we're more depressed or more anxious, because our brain is not as efficient to regulate these emotions. And that is something we are currently working on. I'm working on with uh, William Sauvé, who is a PhD student in my laboratory, looking at the effects uh, or looking at emotional regulation coping strategies and emotional reactivity in uh, athletes um, who sustained several concussions. So, um, and, and, and for whom the last concussion uh, dates for more than like six months. And, and, um, and this contributes again to our understanding that there are, um, to, to, to making it more legitimate for people who are having this post-concussion syndrome, that it's not purely psychological or psychosomatic, but we do find physiological and uh, cognitive uh, related um, deficits uh, that can be associated to regulation and reactivity. Um, and this is really important uh, among other things. I think a lot of people would be really happy to hear you say that um, because I, de I definitely agree that um, one of the worst things is for someone who's been struggling with a concussion for a year and then they go to a doctor's office and the doctor says oh it's in your head you know your brain isn't damaged you're fine and um, I think it's really important that this work is being done to show that people have suffered actual damage and um, it's not just all in their head. Um, well, Alex, you're so right. And I like the way you, you, you frame it because as a clinician, as a neuropsychologist, that is what I hear from people who consult me. Uh, whether, you know, you've mentioned a doctor, but I, I could mention uh, a family member, right. you know? Uh, I can mention it, it's, it's either a husband, a wife, uh, parents, um, well, in, in, in our latest book, which is called, it's in French, so it's called Commotion Cérébrale, uh, This Personnalité Témoigne uh, des Experts uh, Explique. So basically it's concussion uh, and uh, public personalities uh, share their experience and experts explain. So it's on um, 10 Quebec um, high profile personalities, whether it's sports personalities like Simon Gagné, who's a well-known uh, NHL uh, retired, uh, young retired uh, hockey player. We have another NHL player, uh, Joey Junot. We have Olympic athletes, Marianne saint gelais uh, Alexandre Despati. We have uh, a world champion boxer, uh, Marie-Ève Dicker. We have a journalist, um, Isabelle Richer. We have television personalities. We have uh, the internationally renowned photographer, uh, Heidi Hollinger, who took, you know, pictures of, of Putin and, and, you know, like the, the biggest political figures in the world, you know, and they each share their experience. And, and Heidi, you know, was saying how hard it was for her with her children who did not understand her, 
you know, and she became like the boring mom and, and the, you know, the mom who, and, and she, she understands her kids for thinking that for sure, you know, she had full of empathy and compassion for her children, but she felt bad and guilty for not being able to be the mom that she usually is. And, and, you know, she of course would push herself all the time to be that mother, but every time, you know, that would increase her, her symptoms and it would not help her recovery. And, 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 and yes, Heidi and, and, and the others were told often, you know, just shake yourself a bit, you know, it's, it's not you, you're not like that, you know, uh, this is not a concussion, you know, there's something else, figure it out. And, uh, and knowing that science now is able to uh, clarify that point uh, is so important. And, and also, um, and, and, and for workers, you know, who uh, have, people had a car accident or work related accidents who are being told, well, you know, it's in your head and you're not going to be compensated for, for this accident. Um, you're uh, no longer going to be compensated because um, uh, this, there's no physiological origin. And then, you know, they, they lose their job, they, they don't have insurance money, and, and they really end up in a hard position, in a hard situation. So my research, but also my clinical work uh, as a neuropsychologist is focused on assessing people who are in these really complicated, sometimes uh, litigious situations where they have to prove and dem demonstrate objectively, scientifically, you know, in, in the clinical setting, um, that they they do have uh, cognitive consequences. That this con uh, concussion has real uh, consequences in order for them to have you know their works compensation recognized and their their different things. So that, of course, that that there's some of my clinical focus, but uh, my research. Uh, also is interested in, in, in documenting that and, and perhaps also finding ways to, uh, to help people recover more efficiently uh, after they've had a concussion. You know, there's a lot of really interesting work done by uh, the group of John Letty in the States on the effects of physical exercise on uh, concussion, uh, on people who express uh, or who have um, deficits that persist so we have a chronic condition and how uh aerobic progressive aerobic exercise that is well under control can definitely have uh can definitely be a way to improve uh individuals conditions so we this is something we're also uh, currently working on sort of tweaking uh that exercise model and applying it to uh, people who've had uh who are having a post-concussion syndrome I think the exercise aspect is really interesting. Um, when I had my concussion, I felt I honestly didn't make um, recovery until I started going on the bike for five minutes a day. And then I started to increase that. But um, in our support groups, I hear a lot of really mixed things about exercise. Some people say it really helps their symptoms, but other people say every time they try and go for a walk or do anything, slightly to get their heart rate up, they just get symptoms right away. So do you have any um, tips for, for people in that group that feel like- Yeah, yes, I do. Okay. I do because, uh, and this is not scientific, but this is through uh, clinical experience and even the experience of, of the personalities, you know, that, that I presented in, in the book. If I refer again to Heidi Hollinger, um, she had her concussion back, I think in nine, in 2015, when, when the science was really still not uh, out there, or I mean, we knew it, but you know, most doctors and most therapists did not know that you were supposed to exercise. It was still the older paradigm, paradigm saying that you need to stay in the dark, you need to do nothing and to isolate yourself and rest. And so, you know, week after week, she'd see, you know, this, this doctor who'd say, you know, this concussion doctor who would tell her, uh, rest, you know, don't do anything, don't do too much effort. And, and she took it upon herself. She was a very f active, physically active person before her injury. She, she got her injury while playing tennis. And she um, decided to hop on her uh, bike, on her stationary bike. And yeah, it was just five minutes at first, like, like you did, you know, and it wasn't a lot. And she was 
going purely on intuition because there was no science at that time uh, accessible to her and no one had told her about it. And, and I remember, you know, and, and that's what she says in, in her chapter, you know, how every time she'd get off the bike, she would feel awful. She would feel worse stepping out off the bike than she did before going on her bike. But you know what? The next day she'd still go back on. And if it wasn't for five minutes, it was for four minutes. And it was perhaps at a less intensity, but every day she did. And after a while, uh, she um, realized that she was able to do a little more, not faster, not more intensity, but you know, maybe six minutes. And at some point she realized she couldn't do more than six or seven minutes, but she could pedal a little faster. You know, so slowly, I think we do need to um, not push ourselves, but we have to make sure that we keep active. So by pushing ourselves, that is not to, to a level where we have symptoms, you know, that reach like eight or 10 out of 10, and that we start, you know, having uh, intense nausea or vomiting, but I think it is important to remain active. And sometimes symptoms do go up a little, but you know, if they, if they do go up by like two, three points on a scale of 10, and they go down within two, three hours, it will not cause, or we don't think, we have no evidence that this will cause damage to the brain. And I think that is something, an obstacle. And I recently saw that in a patient to, who uh, consulted me, you know, like the thing that kept him from uh, doing anything cognitive or physical was that he was told that every time he'd have symptoms, this was damaging his brain. And he was afraid of that. And he just be, developed this, um, not sure I'm using the right term in English, perhaps I am. Uh, in French, we say kinesiophobie, like the, the phobia or the fright of moving or doing any, act, any act, type of activity, kinesiophobia, I don't know if it's the right word, probably not. Uh, and, and, and so that's what he developed. And when we told him, no, listen, you know, you're, you're not going to damage your brain. Go for walks, you know, have people over. Um, you know, socialize, not with like six people in a coffee shop where there's a lot of noise, but like one person, you know, at, at your house, you know, have, have a quiet dinner, have, you know, interact, don't isolate yourself, do things. And, um, and we find that this has a tremendous impact because there are psychological components that do kick in and that exacerbate uh, symptoms in the condition. Of course, at the core, I believe that in most cases, a post-concussion syndrome does have a biological origin, a neurophysiological origin. Um, uh, but we have to make sure that we identify factors that can increase it, exacerbate it, and maintain that. And those are often related to fear and anxiety that we need to treat. Um, and, and, and so this is super important. But yes, I do recommend that people, you know, it's harder in this COVID uh, situation right now, but still, you know, we can go out, we can have walks, we can have walks with a friend, you know, either with our masks or, or keeping a, you know, a two meter, two and a half meter uh, distance, you know. Um, and so, you know, we're, we, we have to think of physical distancing, but not social distancing. And, and that is so important also with people who, uh, who've had a concussion. Thank you so much um, for everything today. And um, I think you addressed a lot of misconceptions in um, concussion treatment. And um, a lot of these things, they come up in the support group every week. So I know that everyone's gonna be super happy to hear everything you said. Um, is there well, anything you wanted yeah. to talk about before? Well, you know, you're talking about your support group, and I and I think that the support, support group and the um, the podcast you're doing are, are just amazing because um, one thing that we have learned um, from uh, from from um, and that I have learned as a scientist uh, from this this book that we're publishing. Um, with, with by by the way, I'm I'm not the only author on this book. It's it's. Uh, co-authored by um, Diane Sauvé, who's a renowned uh, sports journalist in Quebec, 
uh, also by uh, Veronique Sicard, Dr. Veronique Sicard, who is um, right now a postdoc in the States, and also William Marchambault, who has a master's in, uh, in pharmacology and finishing up a PhD in kinesiology. We find that people report that one of the factors that seems to contribute significantly to their well being and their recovery is having a mentor. Having someone uh, uh, who understands them, who understands what they've been through, and having someone who can, with whom they can bounce around ideas, validate things. You know, like is it normal? It's been like six months. I have these types of symptoms. I feel like you know needles or things, or I, I feel as if I have electric shocks in my head. Am I crazy? Is this normal? So someone else or other people around them who've experienced a concussion and who can share their experience with them. And that seems to have been one of the most significant or one of the significant factors that have helped them. And that's why these, these well-known um, Quebec personalities have accepted to uh, share their stories in the book uh, in order to break uh, you know, the isolation that people feel who have a uh, post-concussion syndrome so that they can see how others have dealt with it, their tricks, and, and uh, also, um, you know, that so they know they're, they're not alone. So yeah, you know, having a concussion cafe, having a concussion, uh, you know, support group, uh, these podcasts, it's, uh, yeah, super, super important. So thank you for your, your great work. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, and I, also, thank you, Nick, from Concussion Talks for helping us create this podcast. Um, and is there anything else you wanted to add before? No, you know, I, I could go on for hours I on know, concussion. Yeah, uh, but, you know, yeah, I think, I think I, I'm glad that we talked about, you know, making sure that we uh, test athletes after an injury correctly uh, to make sure they don't return to play too early and to make sure we find the right ways to assess them in order to determine if there is any type of cognitive pattern that has been affected before they you know to make sure that they are still great learners and you know great students and so that was the first part of the talk and my research on that is i feel is so uh it's so important to, to keep that in mind and the importance of, of you know caring about that acute phase and the consequences it can have long term and having the right tools and, and yeah, the long-term consequences and, and, and the post-concussion syndrome. And, you know, and people who feel that there are, uh, I'm talking here as a clinical neuropsychologist uh, who's had a lot of experience, people who feel that they don't understand themselves uh, or that they have a hard time getting others to understand their, their position or their situation, you know, go see a clinical neuropsychologist. Uh, to get uh, a full comprehensive uh, assessment. You know, we were all across uh, North America, uh, you know, um, um, you know, registered clinical neuropsychologists are present in the USA and all across Canada and in Quebec, you know, I have, there's myself and so many of my colleagues, you know, uh, give us a call, send us an email. And if, if you, yes, yeah, if you have that need to understand, you know, what, what you're going through. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, every, everyone, thank you so much for listening. And thank you, um, Dave, for coming on. Um, also, more information can be found about the McGill Students for Concussion Legacy Foundation at concussionmtl.com. Okay. Thank you. Head Check Health bridges gaps in concussion care through simple, powerful technology. Join organizations like the Canadian Football League, Trek Factory Racing, the Canadian Junior Hockey League, Eastern Washington University, and Volleyball Canada, who rely on Head Check to improve communication and optimize care. Visit headcheckhealth.com for more. The music at the beginning of this podcast is by Ben Sound. W www.bensound.com